And um, I just wanted to give a big thanks to our speaker today, who is Rob Higgins. And Rob is an entomologist with Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, specializing in antecology and taxonomy. In the fall of 2010, Rob confirmed the presence of the European fire ant Myrmica rubra in the province of BC. This ant has been creating considerable issues for a great number of residents, gardeners, and property managers throughout the Fraser Valley, Metro Vancouver, and Vancouver Island. Following this, Rob confirmed the introduction of the rough fire ant, Myrmica scabrinotis, sorry for my pronunciation, and the Argentine ant, Linapithema humil in BC and rediscovered a number of other invasive ant species, such as the tropical stinging ant, Hypoponera punc punctatissima. Arising from these identifications, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Rob has been working to map the distribution of these invasive ants, help with identification of ants of concern, and also work to develop control techniques, especially for the European fire ant. So a big thank you to Rob. I'm going to pass it over to you now. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for the introduction. And, and thanks to you and Claudia for uh, inviting me tonight. Uh, let me just move over to my screen. And one, th there we go. Yep. Perfect. Um, just one second here. I just got a... Uh, There we go. So you've heard this a thousand times before, but first of all, you can hear me, and hopefully, you can see the slide that I have up on the uh, on the screen. That's all good. Looks great. Thanks. Okay. So again, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm always happy to talk about ants um, to anybody who might be interested in them. Uh, with natural history societies, uh, you know, and I know so many people with natural history societies are, are really keen on birds. And I think just as many people would be really fascinated by ants if you were able to identify them and sort of understood what was happening uh, down underneath your feet. Um, but it, they are a real challenge uh, to, um, to know one species from another. Um, <clears throat> but there's some fascinating stories with respect to the ants of British Columbia. And unfortunately, in the last few years, we've seen the introduction of a number of invasive species um, that are relatively new uh, to the province. And I'll talk a little bit about those uh, today as well. So just to say a little bit about what, first of all, ants are. <clears throat> um, based on sort of genetic analyses, we think that ants have been around for about 168 million years, um, splitting off <clears throat> from other hymenopterans the group that uh, includes the ants, the bees, and the wasps. Um, and they appear right now to be a sister group um, that are closely related um, to uh, the sphecoid or thread-waisted wasps um, and the bees. Um, those appear to be the closest relatives um, to the ants um, today. If you know nothing else about ants, they're social. Um, but more than social, technically they're what we call eusocial, um, in that uh, while they live together in a group and they communicate for purposes um, other than just reproduction, um, they uh, divide reproductive rights amongst the uh, members of their colonies um, so that only um, a few members of the colonies are capable of, of reproducing. Uh, and this is one important aspect of sort of being eusocial, a degree of sociality, of course, which uh, is not shared um, with, with humans. Uh, they also have overlapping uh, generations. Uh, and to some degrees, when you're looking at an ant colony in the ground, you can almost think of it as being somewhat plant-like in the sense that they are usually perennial. And you can sort of expect them to, uh, to be where they are uh, next year and often the year after that and so on. Um, they're globally distributed, so you find them almost anywhere. Now, you don't find an awful lot, of course, and, uh, in Antarctica. Um, and there are a handful of islands uh, you know, that don't have native ants. Um, if you've been to Hawaii, um, you have probably encountered ants, you know, uh, if you were to look down at your feet you know, within moments of arriving. Um, but Hawaii has no native ants. Uh, all ants that you see in the Hawaiian Islands have been introduced. 
Uh, and an old friend of mine um, who's traveling the world on various projects was in Iceland uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and he had been collecting and sending me ants uh, from around the world as he was traveling. And so I suggested that he send me some ants from, I, uh, from Iceland. Uh, and uh, he ended up sending me an email a little later on explaining that he couldn't find any. Um, and interestingly, Iceland also has no native species of ants. I'm sure a few have been introduced, um, but none um, are native to the island itself. They love heat. And so wherever you find ants, you will typically find them in the warmest uh, locations uh, in the environment. Uh, and they communicate chemically. Uh, so uh, they have very extensive use of pheromones uh, in order to sort of coordinate colony activity. Although I'm not sure if um, Assam uh, Renier from SFU might be attending or not tonight, but uh, he's currently working and trying to explain how carpenter ants might be communicating vibrationally. Um, but primarily ants um, use pheromones uh, to coordinate their activities. And they vastly outnumber you. It's been estimated there are about a million ants on the planet for every human. So um, right now there are about 15,000 species um, identified. It's estimated there are probably as many again that have not been identified. Um, and I've just kind of thrown in a couple of sort of non-British Columbia ants here. Uh, these are photos that were taken when I was in Borneo uh, a number of years ago. Um, this here, for example, is Harpic Mathis. Um, this is the genus Mystrium. And interestingly, I will mention uh, and a relative of Mystrium uh, a little later in the talk today that you have in the Victoria and Vancouver Island uh, area. Um, they have a very um, unusual biology uh, for ants. Um, this is Phytale. Uh, we have one species of this in British Columbia. It's barely two millimeters long. Um, and <laughs> this is Polyrachis. So you can see, um, you know, when you're looking at ants, you know, considerably magnified, quite often there are uh, uh, really clear sort of visual cues that kind of give you, you know, a key as to what it might be that you are looking at um, that can at least get you sort of down to the genus level and maybe have a little bit of an understanding of the ecology of the species from there. But that's a little bit what I'm gonna talk about today. So, so first of all, a quick primer on ant colonies. Um, in the, the bottom two photos, you see winged ants. And what we have is a virgin queen uh, on the left, and we have a male on the right. Uh, interestingly, almost all male ants are black, um, or often completely black. Um, and they're produced within colonies, in most cases, only a few weeks or a month or so before they'll undergo a mating flight. Uh, they're not usually maintained in most ant colonies um, when they are not uh, about to undergo a reproductive flight. There is an exception to that with the carpenter ants, but um, by and large, uh, males um, are, are not commonly found in, in most colonies. Um, over to the, uh, the left, we have a virgin queen, uh, and queens are typically larger than the workers. Um, and the unmated queens, of course, will still have their wings. And so what happens in what we might call the standard ant uh, is that at a certain time of the year, often coordinated by a weather event. Um, so for example, down in the lower mainland and in um, southern Vancouver Island, quite commonly in early June, you get a heat wave. Um, and that heat wave, uh, when the temperatures suddenly go up, um, you know, from the previous day quite markedly, is usually the cue for a great number of, uh, of species within the genus Formica to undergo mating flights. And you'll see a great number of uh, winged uh, ants uh, flying about at that time. But in any event, they undergo those mating flights. Um, in the standard ant, um, the uh, queen will mate once, um, and the male will then die. Um, the queen will drop to the ground, uh, will shed her wings, and she will initiate a new colony. The, uh, the queen will lay the first clutch of eggs, um, and she will raise those eggs herself in, in the case of most species of ants, but not all. Um, 
and she will remain within the nest, kind of raising uh, those eggs uh, to uh, adults. Um, and those adults will then go on to become the workers that will then take over all aspects of the uh, nest maintenance, foraging for food, uh, caring for uh, newly laid eggs, uh, and so on. Um, the workers will be all female uh, because of some unusual aspects of the genetics of ants. Um, all uh, fertilized eggs will become females. Uh, and unfertilized eggs will become males. So once the colony has matured um, and it is stable, bringing in adequate food, it's been growing for a while, um, the uh, queen will start to lay eggs that will become new virgin queens um, and also new males. And of course, she won't fertilize the eggs that will become males. Now, the Canadian ant is seldom the standard ant. Um, we have a number of sort of deviations on that sort of natural history strategy in Canada, and largely it's driven by our climate. So, for example, many of the species that we have in Canada are what we call polygynous, which means that they have multiple queens. So they aren't simply single queen colonies, but they are often comprised of many queens. Uh, and this appears to be a more common strategy the farther north uh, you go. Um, and it is likely that this is a consequence of the very high mortality rate uh, for single queens in trying to initiate colonies and surviving the first winter. Uh, it appears to be better if you can have a number of queens that can kind of cluster together with whatever workers they've been able to produce uh, over the previous season. That appears to sort of get them off to sort of a stronger start over the first few winters. Um, in some of our um, ant species, for example, in carpenter ants, they'll initiate um, their colonies this way, uh, and then the queens will fight amongst themselves and only one will survive. But in a great number of our species, um, the multiple queens will persist throughout the uh, life cycle of the uh, colony. Um, this is a photograph actually of European fire ants um, from a lifted paving stone. Uh, and you can probably see right away that there are quite a number of ants in this photograph, which are larger um, than the surrounding worker ants. Um, and these are the queens of the, uh, the European fire ant. <clears throat> it is a, a multiple queen um, species, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to control. Um, because in control efforts, you can get rid of even half the queens, um, but the remaining queens uh, can um, fairly quickly compensate for the losses of the other queens and actually increase uh, the numbers of ants um, that they are uh, producing, you know, by increasing their egg laying. So multiple queens, definitely more common um, here in Canada. Um, the other thing about our colonies is a little different than many er other areas of the world um, and different than uh, Victoria. Um, when we get into the interior of British Columbia, uh, is that the ants have to deal with a colder climate um, than they would prefer. And so they take advantages um, of a number of attributes in the uh, landscape in order to sort of maximize the heat gain. And one of the most common uh, is to nest underneath flat rocks that are exposed to the sun. Uh, the rocks will uh, um, gain heat from sun exposure during the day, and it'll hold that heat during the night. Um, and when you um, kind of get a sense when, you, when you're looking for ants, um, and you sort of know what type of rocks they seem to prefer to nest under, you can virtually find a colony almost every single time you pick up that type of a rock. You know, a flat rock that's 15, 20 centimeters uh, sort of in diameter, uh, that's not too, uh, not too deep, uh, and it's almost certain to host an ant colony underneath. Um, flickers um, often like to lift up these rocks and uh, get at the uh, ants underneath, uh, obviously when the, uh, those rocks are not too large um, for them to, uh, to manage. Um, but uh, <clears throat> that's a strategy that they <clears throat> readily employ <clears throat> in order to obtain ants. Um, another strategy um, sort of throughout Canada and becoming more increasingly important um, is the movement out of the soil and into woody debris. So in the central interior of British Columbia, the, it, it, in the cooler, moister forests, uh, we see soil temperature conditions which are really poor for uh, ant development. And so we don't see a lot of ants actually direct, directly nesting in the soil. 
Um, rather, they move into above ground woody debris. And that woody debris has many attributes which are similar to those rocks, those flat rocks uh, that I was just talking about. Um, the wood heats up in the sun uh, through the day. It holds that heat overnight and provides a, a really good nesting habitat um, for uh, ant species. And then this was sort of mentioned um, by a couple of people right before um, the presentation tonight, um, thatched mounds. So we have quite a number of species of thatch building ants uh, in British Columbia. Uh, and this appears to be sort of another um, uh, attribute uh, to sort of maximizing heat in an otherwise sort of cool uh, climate. Um, quite often the ants will start in uh, a piece of woody debris um, on the surface of the ground and then they'll start um, piling thatch around it. And in the interior, um, if you were to put uh, a temperature sensor inside those mounds in the spring, you'd find that the temperatures would be, you know, ambient, ambient, uh, and then within 24 hours, um, even when there still might be snow sitting on top of the mound, um, you'll see the temperature inside the nest go up to um, somewhere close to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and the ants within that thatch mound will maintain that temperature, plus or minus five degrees Celsius, um, largely throughout the rest of the summer. Um, when it gets too hot inside the nest, they'll kind of open up more vents to uh, vent out that heat. Um, and on colder days, they will close over um, entr um, entrances and exits to the, uh, uh, to the nest uh, in order to sort of trap heat uh, internally uh, within the uh, thatch pound. Um, and in fact, those thatch mounds have been documented to change their shape um, so that they sort of present a larger surface area to the sun um, as it sort of progresses across the sky from spring through summer into, uh, into early fall. So um, one other way that uh, ants will occasionally uh, adapt again to that risk of high winter mortality uh, is nest parasitism. And so a number of species of ants in British Columbia, um, rather than risk trying to start their own nest by themselves, um, will find a host species. Um, the queens will enter that nest, uh, they'll kill the queen of that uh, colony, um, and they will take over as sort of the reigning queen of the colony. Um, as the uh, colony workers begin to die out, they're replaced by um, the, uh, the species um, that has parasitized uh, the, uh, these nests. Um, this was just some data um, from when I was working on my PhD project, um, looking at uh, ant communities in different post-harvest um, stages uh, up in the Houston Smithers area. Um, and one of the things that we had sort of noted um, was that one of the more common ants for Myconia rufibarbus, um, which was present um, in the very early clear cuts, just two to three years after uh, harvesting, um, grew quite considerably in abundance uh, in eight to 10 years. And then the uh, populations collapsed, um, remaining low but steady uh, in the next couple of sort of serial stages. Um, and what appeared to be the reason for this and something that was actually observed when we opened up some of the nests um, was because they had been parasitized by Formica acerva. So this is the ant um, in which the queens have moved into the Neorufobarbus nests, killed their queen and taken over. Uh, and so you see that um, as the uh, Formica acerva numbers uh, increase, uh, the Formica neo rufibarbus numbers at the same time were collapsing, uh, significantly due to the presence of Formica acerva. And quite a number of these nests, uh, when we opened them up, uh, we found Formica acerva with uh, essentially Formica neo rufibarbus slaves um, still inside those nests. So <clears throat> nest parasitism, yet another way of sort of getting around those risks of trying to start a colony um, uh, by yourself uh, when winter conditions are gonna be really quite serious. So um, as we're talking to the Natural History Society, you know, how do ants interact uh, with their environment? I'll just give you a couple of examples uh, here. So first of all, ranching. Um, ants um, are, of course, well known for tending aphids, and this is a photo here of Formica acerva tending to conifer aphids, uh, Cynera um, species, um, sort of shown here. 
Um, many of the Formica uh, species ants, uh, and as well as carpenter ants, uh, and some other species uh, take advantage of aphids. So the aphids, of course, um, are feeding on the uh, on the plants, uh, and they're secreting what we call honeydew, um, which is high in sugars and amino acids, which the ants use as a food source. Um, this appears to be particularly important in the spring, uh, when there's not a lot of other sort of insect material um, for the ants to exploit um, as a food source. And so they tend these aphids, and in return for the honeydew, um, they uh, will protect the aphids from predators. Uh, and in one instance, um, uh, in an area near Williams Lake, um, I was watching uh, carpenter ants uh, that were established on some giant conifer aphids uh, in a young spruce plantation. Uh, and I watched a, a carpenter ant actually walk out um, of its nest carrying um, a Cynera aphid. Uh, and it walked it up the uh, spruce tree and actually placed it on the, uh, on the tree exactly where it wanted it to be along with these other aphids. Um, essentially, it appears that those aphids were being maintained in the nest over winter uh, and the carpenter ants were deliberately placing them where they wanted them to be um, on the surrounding spruce trees. Um, ants as predators. Uh, so there's quite a bit of documentation with respect to the ability of ants to remove invertebrates um, from the uh, surroundings. It can be quite impressive. In one study in uh, Quebec, uh, a very large thatched mound was bringing in something like 140 um, insect prey items every 10 minutes uh, into the uh, thatched mound. And this is a photo here um, just of some uh, Formica rivita ants uh, attacking um, spruce budworm. And in full disclosure, um, I actually dropped that spruce budworm into the middle of those ants uh, to sort of see how they would handle it. Uh, they were more than happy to uh, take this um, as prey. Now, here's one thing, perhaps just an opportunity to mention something. Um, when we see these adult ants going after a prey item like this um, spruce budworm, we might think that they are consuming this material. They're, they're, they're eating the caterpillar um, for food directly themselves. Um, ants, because of the constriction between their thorax and their abdomen, um, are incapable of consuming solid food. And so when they take an item like a caterpillar, well, they could drink the hemolymph, the, the essential insect blood of, of that caterpillar. Um, what they're really doing is taking this caterpillar, dragging it back to their nest, um, and they are going to feed that caterpillar to their larvae. The larvae are perfectly capable of breaking down um, and digesting uh, solid food. Um, and then those larvae um, will regurgitate back the, um, the products of that digestive, that, of that digestion um, to, the, to, the worker, to the worker ants. Um, so in a way, um, within the ant colony, the larvae are functioning as a stomach, um, and all of the solid food is being directed towards, towards them. Um, they're also important as prey. Um, bears um, and a number of other mammals will readily take ant colonies um, as a food source. Um, so this is a photo um, uh, which was shared for me from Minnesota. Um, sort of showing the black, up in the upper corner of this black bear, which is ripped open an old log, um, looking for ants. Um, and then down in the lower right, um, we have an example of a project I provided some assistance with a number of years ago, looking at the diet of grizzly bears. Uh, and this is a stump, uh, which was hosting carpenter ants, um, which has been rip, ripped open by uh, grizzly bears, um, looking for food. Um, as a prey item, again, um, flickers primarily feed upon ants throughout their lives um, as a food source. Um, but we also have some specialized cases like the Williamson sapsucker. And so this is a red listed species in British Columbia. Um, and for mysterious reasons um, that in some ways you wish you could sit down with this bird and tell them that there must be an easier way to raise their young. Um, but the Williamson sapsucker um, lands on the boles of trees and it plucks off um, large ants and it flies those ants back uh, and feeds those ants 
to their young. This appears to be virtually the exclusive food source that they use for the young. So the wings and sapsucker is very much dependent um, upon ant species uh, in their habitat. Um, they like to take uh, large bodied ants, uh, large carpenter ants and large thatching ants and fly those back uh, to uh, their nest to feed to their young. Um, I mentioned flickers a moment ago. Flickers seem to have the opposite strategy. They go after um, small body um, ants um, and rather than grab one or two in their beaks and fly back to the nest, um, flickers tend to scoop up large numbers of them. Um, they tend to go after small ants that like to swarm. Um, they scoop up large numbers at a time uh, for feeding. So they have a very different strategy for feeding on ants um, between flickers and the wings of sapsucker. Um, they're also uh, important in seed dispersal um, and, and seed predation. Um, this is just a little bit of data from a student who was working in the Kamloops area um, a few years ago, uh, looking at seed removal um, from some traps uh, in Lactabois Park near Kamloops. Um, and what you're looking at in grams here um, are, is the amount of seed that's been removed over 24 hours. Um, there were a total of 10 grams. Um, but you can see that ants are on par and sometimes exceed um, mammals and birds uh, with respect uh, to their ability to collect and, and move seeds. Um, the one thing that uh, might naturally follow sort of mentioning sort of seed transport um, might be pollination. Um, and ants have been noted uh, with respect to pollination, but generally speaking, not in a positive sense. Um, some of the compounds that are found in the exoskeleton of ants appear to sterilize pollen. Um, and so while they might move from flower to flower and, and take advantage of nectar um, and carry pollen, um, not a lot of that pollen appears to be viable um, by the time it has spent um, uh, any degree of time um, attached to their exoskeleton. A couple of words about ant behavior. So um, ants tend to use rules of thumb um, with respect to uh, how they coordinate their activities. Uh, so if you give ants, for example, sort of two pathways to a food source, you know, a long and a short, um, they'll very quickly sort of collapse their foraging efforts onto the shortest possible route and abandon the longest. And largely this is because when they find a food source, um, they begin to tap out a, a trail pheromone, uh, which other ants will use to find the food. That trail pheromone is volatile. And the longer the trail, um, the longer some of that pheromone has been down uh, and it becomes, it, it is volatile, it dissipates and becomes weaker. Uh, and ants, as a rule of thumb, will very quickly uh, utilize the root which has the strongest pheromone scent um, or trail pheromone on it uh, and will abandon the long way around uh, in favor of the, uh, of the short. Um, this focus on uh, pheromones for communication, uh, particularly in foraging, uh, is really uh, evident when you take a look at a phenomena that arises occasionally in army ants. So army ants are, are, are blind um, and they follow each other uh, as they are foraging based upon trail pheromones of the ants which are being uh, immediately ahead of them. Uh, and occasionally you will get ants um, that are deflected um, from the main trunk of the army ant swarm that's sort of moving through uh, rainforest. Uh, so there might be a log, there might be a rock. Um, and so a few individuals, or a number of individuals are deflected off to one side or the other. Um, and they will start to walk in a circle um, and they're laying down trail pheromone um, while they are walking in that circle. And by the time they find their way back to the main trunk, um, the colony has moved on and the strongest scent is what they left behind a few minutes ago. Um, and they will start to follow their own trail pheromone. And so this arises uh, towards the back end of these army ant trunks, um, sort of moving through the forest and they will start to, they will walk in this circle following their own trail pheromone um, until they all desiccate and die sometimes, which takes 24 or 48 hours. But um, this circular milling in army ants has been sort of notable 
uh, for <laughs> sort of demonstrating how fixated certain types of ants are on pheromones. And in this case, they don't seem to have a good solution to breaking this, uh, this cycle. Um, this is a photo which was sent to me from um, one of the, a naturalist member um, with the North Okanagan uh, field naturalists. Um, she took this while she was vacationing in Australia and it's a mushroom which had a crack in it. Um, and there were ants on this floodplain that um, were stuffing rocks into the crack of the, uh, of the mushroom. And she was really perplexed as to why these ants were doing this. Uh, and I wondered about this for a while as well. And when she mentioned that they were on a floodplain, I, I believe what was happening here was that these were ants um, that live in an area where the ground frequently cracks um, uh, when it becomes dry. Um, and whenever the ground around their nest cracks, they fill in those cracks. Um, but the ants aren't capable of really recognizing what's really part of their nest versus a crack in another structure which happened to have blown onto the surface of their nest. So they found this crack and they started stuffing rocks into it, um, which is what they would probably do under natural conditions um, in order to uh, maintain normal nest repair. So again, ants use these rules of thumb, which sometimes can lead to sort of what appear to be quite strange behavior. Now, I always feel sort of the need to sort of talk about ant bites and stings, where uh, the general public's never quite sure, do ants bite or do they sting? Um, well, um, many ants in British Columbia do have a stinger, um, but of all of the native species of ants in British Columbia that have a stinger, I have yet to encounter one that has used it on me. Uh, even though I have, you know, roughly handled a very great many of them. So some ants are capable of stinging, and all ants, of course, are capable of, of biting. Um, <laughs> some of our most common ants in the genus Formica do not have a stinger, and so that's not something that they're capable of doing, but they will readily bite. Um, they're typically not strong enough to break the skin, but quite often um, they will pinch up the skin and they'll swing their abdomen around and they'll uh, drop formic acid um, onto the skin. Something that you would feel if they had broken the skin, but again, um, our ants aren't really capable of, of doing that here. Um, so, <clears throat> but some of the ant species do definitely have a stinger. Um, and I, I thought I would just introduce Justin Schmidt's uh, sort of pain index associated with ant stings. Um, he sort of ranked, uh, many of you might have heard of Justin Schmidt's pain index before. He's allowed himself to be stung by virtually every vertebrate um, on the planet to uh, kind of get a sense of the kind of pain that's ex um, that he experiences with those things. Um, and he's got the scale from one to four. And so first of all, this is the red imported fire ant. Solenopsis invicta. If any of you have been down in Florida, Texas, Louisiana, you've almost certainly encountered this ant. It swarms quite readily. It stings. It definitely hurts, um, but it's not overwhelming with respect to the pain that it's, it can inflict. Um, one of the big issues with this ant is it tends to swarm and sting synchro synchronously, as you can see has happened um, in this photo on the, uh, on the right. Um, but uh, Justin describes this as sharp, sudden, mildly alarming, like walking across a shag carpet and reaching for a light switch. So a, a mild degree of discomfort associated with this. Uh, the bullhorn acacia ant. Um, these are the ants that uh, live in thorns and acacia trees and protect the tree against uh, defoliators. Um, it has a stinger, um, which Schmidt describes as rare, piercing, elevated sort of pain, like someone had fired a staple into your cheek. Uh, the Maricopa harvester ant, on the scale of one to four, um, he ranks this as a three. Um, these photos here, by the way, um, harvester ants are the ants which are commonly sold in ant colonies um, when you buy them from some you know, corporation or, or send away um, for them. Um, and a couple of years ago at Thompson Rivers, um, some of our first year biology students wanted to do an experiment on ants, uh, unbeknownst to me, um, and the lab demonstrators sort of ordered in um, some harvester ants. There was supposed to be Pogonomermix occidentalis, um, and 
when they came in, they asked me uh, if I would just check them and make sure that it was the correct species. Pogonomermix occidentalis has definitely a very painful sting, um, but it's nothing like the Maricopa harvester ant. Uh, in any event, it turned out that the ants that uh, had come in were in fact the Maricopa harvester ant. Um, this actually is truly the most toxic venom um, of any um, insect um, on the planet. Um, and as a consequence, um, these ants were not made available to our first year students and they lived out the rest of their lives in an ant colony on my desk um, for uh, quite a while. But in any event, um, Justin described the pain of being stung by one of these as bold and unrelenting. Somebody is using a drill to excavate your ingrown toenail. Um, and as a note, 12 stings of this ant will kill a large rat. Um, so it's quite notable. Uh, and then finally, this, the, uh, the scale four plus goes to the bullet ant, um, which is described as pure, intense, brilliant pain, like walking over flaming charcoal with a three inch nail in your heel. Um, as many of you are birders, you're probably familiar with Dick Cannings. And if you ever run into Dick Cannings, you can ask him what his experience was um, with these ants. Uh, as he was stung by one of these one night, and he told me um, that for the first four hours after the, uh, he had been stung, he would, have, he would have agreed to have had his arm amputated uh, if it would have relieved the pain um, from this uh, sting. So fortunately, we don't have anything like that here in BC. Um, we have the European fire ant and the rough fire ant, and they're more close to the um, red imported fire ant that you find in Texas with respect to uh, discomfort being, from being stung. Anyway, a few of the ants of British Columbia. Uh, we have about 100 confirmed species, um, but there's still a lot that we can learn about ants. Uh, when I started working on ants a number of years ago, uh, Marmica alaskensis, um, was listed as being suspected as being in the province. Uh, it turns out that this ant is actually one of the most common ants found in forests um, from in central to northern British Columbia. Uh, by no means is this a rare species um, in, um, in BC. Uh, you can also find it on the Duffy Lake Road and see off the skis, see the Sky Highway. Um, and so there's still a lot out there that we haven't really documented very well. Um, I thought I would mention the smallest native ant that we have, uh, Fidelie californica. Um, this is sort of barely two millimeters long. Um, and when I look at this photograph, which was being used to document it, I, I give credit to the person who mounted this ant on a little paper, black paper point, uh, as I have also um, mounted these <laughs> uh, Fidelie ants onto uh, paper points. And I can tell you that you have to hold your breath for a very, very long time. Just the slightest exhale and this ant is long, goss, long gone and lost uh, in, in the lab. Um, but this is the smallest species that we have in the province. And this is the largest species, uh, Campanotus um, vicinus. Um, and this species for Campanotus, which are carpenter ants, is notably different uh, in that Whereas most species of carpenter ants, when you disturb them, they will mill around and run away from you um, uh, in sort of a panic. Uh, Campanotus vicinus will hold its ground and run at you. Um, you find this typically in grasslands as opposed to directly in, in woody debris. Um, but it is, um, uh, vicinus uh, sounds a little bit like vicious and that's probably appropriate for this particular ant. Um, I couldn't help but notice 1954, there was the old movie uh, called Them, uh, one of those stories from the 50s about, you know, radioactive insects sort of, you know, causing death and destruction. Um, and they very specifically uh, called the ants um, in this movie Campanotus vicinus, which I thought was appropriate. Uh, it's a particularly aggressive species to use. Uh, what I really found quite amusing in, in the movie, though, was the fact that they um, they sent off plaster casts, these giant ants in the desert, you know, to the uh, USDA and uh, somebody recognized the uh, footprints as being ant footprints. And as somebody who has worked with ants for quite a number of years, I'm pretty sure I have no idea what an ant footprint looks like. Um, so smallest, largest, um, some of the other interesting species that we have within the province. Um, are 
uh, are slave takers. I had mentioned um, nest parasitism uh, previously um, as fairly common, um, you know, adaptation sort of getting around uh, those risks of early winter mortality. Um, we have Polyergis mexicanus, and this is an obligate slave taker. Um, so the queens of this species um, will attack um, ants, usually in the genus Formica, those medium black ants that are really common in lawns. Um, they'll kill the queen, um, take over the colony and lay their own eggs. Um, but whereas with nest parasitism, we saw that new species kind of take over and then operate independently, that doesn't happen with polyergis. Um, polyergis, um, as the uh, original enslaved ants uh, begin to die out, um, polyergis begins to engage in slave runs. Um, so the new workers that are produced by the, uh, the queen um, will swarm out of their uh, nest. They will find another uh, host nest species. Um, they'll kill any of the uh, host ants that try to get in its way um, and uh, swarm into the nest and then carry away the eggs, uh, the larvae and the pupae. Uh, and carry them back to uh, their own nest. And so that they have a constant sort of refreshment of uh, these new slave ants. Um, I've actually got a colony of these in my neighbor's yard um, and they regularly raid uh, an ant colony in my front yard um, in the summer. Uh, and what's particular kind of strange about this is that they almost always engage in these slave raids uh, between four and 6 p.m. I'd say 3.30 to 5.30 kind of kind of thing, at least where I am. But they're very predictable with respect to uh, the time of day uh, when they'll engage in slave, uh, slave runs. Um, you'll notice the mandibles um, for this uh, species, these long sickles. Um, they're capable of sort of punk um, puncturing the uh, exoskeleton of any ant that sort of stands in its way, or wrapping themselves around a larva or a pupa. Uh, and carrying it back to their nest. Uh, they're incapable of feeding themselves. They, they absolutely do depend upon the slave ants uh, that they uh, raise from the larva and the pupae uh, in order to, uh, to maintain uh, their own nest. Now, early when I was showing some pictures uh, from Borneo, I talked about mystrium, and I said it was related to a uh, species that we have here in British Columbia. And these are the Dracula ants. We have one species here, Stigmatoma oregon ants. Um, which you will find on Vancouver Island, Salt Spring, Quadra, um, so scattered about. And this is a weekly social species. The colonies are small, only about 50 or 60 ants. Um, they will not attempt to defend the nest. Um, and where I had mentioned earlier that larvae function as the stomach of the colony. Well, in the case of these ants, they like to feed on um, centipedes. And as I have discovered as a consequence of uh, sort of interacting with an ant enthusiast, uh, they also like damp wood termites um, as a food source. But in any event, they will take that food back to their nest. They will feed it to the larvae, but the larvae aren't capable of regurgitating back the uh, digested contents of what they have just consumed. Um, so the uh, worker ants. Uh, and the uh, queen within the colony will bite um, their own larvae and cause them to bleed. Um, and they drink the blood of their own larvae in order to get at those digested contents that the larvae don't, aren't capable of passing back to them directly. And hence these are called Dracula or vampire ants because they feed on the blood of their, their own young. So you will typically find these in pieces of woody debris um, on the island. They're not common, but um, if you sort of know what to look for, for with, especially with respect to the type of wood that they tend to, uh, to tend to nest in, um, they're not usually hard to find. Um, and we also have here uh, in South Okanagan, honey pot ants. And so uh, these are found uh, from Southern British Columbia down to Mexico. Um, these were used as a winter food source um, uh, by indigenous peoples. Um, uh, for uh, thousands of years. Um, essentially, 
in this um, species of ant, um, as food becomes plentiful uh, in the environment, we have a specialized cast um, of the workers uh, that can uh, store all of that surplus food uh, in their swollen abdomens. Uh, and so they take food from incoming workers uh, or from the larvae um, that have digested solid material. Um, they will then attach themselves to the roof of the uh, colony, kind of nicely keeping themselves out of the way. Um, and when food no is no longer available, um, they will um, uh, regurgitate um, the uh, food back to the workers to kind of keep the colony going. Um, so they're capable of food storage, which is really quite fascinating. Again, in South Okanagan, sort of found a Soyuz Oliver, uh, but not much further north than that. And I thought I would include this just as an example um, of sort of a, of a very different application for ants. I was contacted by somebody who's just immigrated to uh, Canada. Um, and they had a tradition where they had come from of uh, taking Easter eggs. Um, they paint them with a pigment, which is acid sensitive, and they place them on thatch mounds. Uh, and then they let the thatched ants spray formic acid over them. Um, and the acid changes the coloration of the, uh, of the pigment. Um, and so they were kind of keen to uh, give this a go to take their kids um, and, and do this uh, the first year that had, they had come to Canada. And they were looking for thatch mounds um, in Van the Vancouver area. Uh, unfortunately, the only thatch mounds I knew of were on a highway off ramp near McDonald's on Annis Island. Um, but they went down there um, and they, um, they, they put the eggs um, onto the thatch mound um, and uh, they got the, you know, sort of the scattered patterns that you can see on the darker eggs in the, uh, in the upper right there. Um, just before we started, um, there was a discussion about thatch mounds. And just recently, we did get some photographs in and some very large thatch mounds, thatch mounds on uh, Salt Spring Island. So I just threw this photo in two minutes before the uh, talk began, um, <clears throat> just to kind of illustrate the uh, size um, which these appear to get to from time to time. These are actually the largest that I've seen in British Columbia. There were a number of photos, but this was the only one that didn't have the person in it. Um, and I didn't want to include a photo of somebody, um, <clears throat> although they have given permission to, to reuse the photos. Um, but um, typically bears uh, dig into these nests to feed on the ants or other mammals. And so they don't usually get as large as what you see here. So the invasives, just to say a few words about those, it's becoming increasingly an issue here in British Columbia. Um, this is one of the old invasives we've had here in BC, actually dating back to about the 1960s. Um, there don't seem to be any records of it for decades. And then in the last 10 years, I've been receiving specimens of these from Toronto, Edmonton, Winnipeg, um, Victoria, and Vancouver. Um, and interestingly, it all seem to be associated with restaurants. Um, it's a very small ant, and what's notable about them is they usually get into the soil underneath buildings. Um, and when they um, undergo reproductive flights, you get thousands of virgin queens coming up through cracks in the foundation. And unlike many other types of uh, queens, these are aggressive. Um, and so they swarm on the inside of buildings and uh, they start stinging people, uh, and particularly in restaurants. Um, and so it seemed really quite odd that suddenly I was getting these specimens from quite a number of different locations, but all associated with restaurants, uh, until I actually got some specimens from a uh, warehouse um, that was a restaurant supply company. Um, and I have a feeling they have been shipping these ants all across Canada for the past few years and have been seeding the tropical stinging ant um, all over the place for the last while. Uh, the Argentine ants, um, this is a species which uh, turned up in Victoria um, a couple of years ago, or a few years ago now. Um, it doesn't have a stinger, um, but it uh, is notable in very, very uh, dense colonies. Uh, you can get a million workers in 10 square meters of soil. Um, and they tend to, when they find a food source, they tend to uh, swarm it in numbers that's not typical for ants. So whereas if you have some odorous house ants that are kind of forming a thin trail to some food that you've left on your counter, um, 
if you uh, were at home and perhaps had been baking and had a thin layer of flour dust on your countertop, if you had Argentine ants, um, you'd wake up in the morning to a solid sheet of ants on your countertops. They, they recruit in numbers like that. So um, this colony has, is still present. Um, it's in sort of a high traffic area, um, but the numbers have reduced um, because the, uh, the main nest uh, was accidentally discovered. Um, it is, however, it does have multiple queens and the destruction of a large portion of the colony has not resulted in its loss completely. And so I suspect the numbers for this ant are gonna to continue to build uh, again in the, uh, in the area. The pavement ant, um, this is more of an irritant or a nuisance ant um, in British Columbia, um, but it turned up about 2004 uh, in Tawasin and then very quickly spread across Metro Vancouver uh, and now is found here in Kamloops and I don't know how much farther north it has spread in, in British Columbia. Um, it's a small ant, it tends to get into homes and is very difficult to eradicate. Uh, you can use baits, they kind of disappear for a little while, but once you have them, you're fairly certain you're going to be dealing with them repeatedly um, in perpetuity. Um, the Asian needle ant, um, we don't have this in BC, but we came close a few years ago. Uh, this ant turned up uh, in Bellingham, Washington, and fortunately seems to have self-extirpated. Um, I've kind of got, I'm, I'm, I, I keep in contact with the professional pest associations to make sure that uh, if anybody comes across this, that um, they'll let me know. This is one of those species that we would like to eradicate as fast as possible if it does become established. Typically gets into woody debris, into um, where people store wood um, over winter. Um, it has a very, very painful sting. Uh, and as a consequence, is isn't something that uh, we'd like to see establish and become problematic. Um, but it's certainly possible, and I expect it will turn up in British Columbia. So this is a species that turned up, just looking at the time here, um, in uh, 2011. Um, most of you aren't entomologists, but those who might be entomologists would probably know Peter Belton, um, who passed away a few years ago, uh, who was a world authority on mosquitoes. Um, this ant turned up in his backyard um, back in 2011, um, and uh, he was being stung by it, as was his wife, and he wanted to know what this was. We thought it was the European fire ant, it must be, until he sent me some specimens, and it very definitely wasn't the European fire ant, and I had, frankly, no idea. It wasn't a native species, so um, it was a bit of a quest to figure out what this was. Um, when I first collected this, um, <clears throat> it happened I was going to Quebec um, to take a look at the collection of Andre Francoeur, who has the largest collection of ants in Canada. Um, and uh, we looked at it and kind of came to a tentative uh, identification. Um, once I left Quebec, I had gone down to E.O. Wilson's lab uh, in Harvard, um, and the experts there, <clears throat> um, Stephen Cover and others, kind of looked at it and we sort of thought, uh, well, it looks like it's uh, what's known as Mermica specio specioides. Um, and we uh, got it barcoded and discovered that we were wrong. <laughs> um, it was a different European species up um, Mermica scabronotus. And so this is uh, the rough fire ant um, that we're referring to it as now. Um, so from that initial finding in 2011 in Peter Belton's uh, um, home, um, this has become quite notable for being present at the Vancouver International Airport, um, where its flight or mating activities in the late summer and its aggregations at the end of runways, um, which have been drawing in birds, have actually been disrupting runway operations. Um, this species of ant, uh, Romica scabronotus, now accounts for probably 75% of the identifications that I get coming in. Um, I've actually got eight containers sitting behind me right now, and I'll be surprised if most of them are not the rough fire ant. Uh, they've spread all through Southern Vancouver Island. They spread into the Fraser Valley through Metro Vancouver. Um, essentially, they are similar to the European fire ant. They're capable of stinging, but they don't form anywhere near as as many colonies in a small area, and they're not as aggressive. So they're kind of the European fire ant light, um, and people are generally happy that they have this ant instead of this ant. <laughs> 
So this is the main invasive that's been causing problems. And I'll just wrap up on this in just a, just a second here. So the European fire ant, um, this is a sign in the district of North Vancouver warning people in a park uh, not to remain stationary, um, which is not the sort of sign that you expect to see when you go to enjoy a park. Um, you want to sit down, kind of quietly enjoy the environment. Um, but the European fire ant has a way of making that uh, difficult. Um, this is the where we have the European fire ant right now through Metro Vancouver, the Fraser Valley, um, up to Courtney, um, Oak Bay, Victoria, uh, and we've got one little colony up in Naramata. Um, these are the cities in which it has sort of been established, and I've underlined the two which have the greatest number of, of colonies, which would be Chilliwack uh, and Vancouver. Um, Chilliwack has a shocking number of European fire ants, um, which is really quite strange in the sense that one of the few cities that I have no records from whatsoever is Abbotsford. And Abbotsford, of course, is not far from Chilliwack. But given what Abbotsford's been through recently, they probably don't need fire ants on top of everything else to, uh, to deal with. Um, so who's affected by the European uh, fire ant? Um, residential property owners, uh, parks, municipalities, botanical gardens, gardening centers, equestrian areas, community gardeners, and pest control professionals. Um, it's kind of had a unique impact on everyone here um, where it has become established. Um, this is an email from a Chilliwack resident in 2014 that kind of gives you an idea of what happens when they turn up on your property. And um, she's simply explaining that she has kids that can no longer use their property in, in the backyard. And they've been playing in the carport, but now they're coming up through cracks in the carport. Um, and um, they don't know what they're going to do about it um, because the kids are going to be inside for the entire summer. Uh, we've had one case of anaphylaxis, but fortunately only one. Um, we've had some fairly serious cases of edema associated with the European fire ant, um, but only one anaphylaxis. Um, so uh, Ralph Olson here, uh, four days in hospital. Um, his condition wasn't great for uh, a period of time. He was helping a friend um, at the edge of a, uh, at a koi pond um, pull out a water pump. And I guess fire ants were associated there. He got swarmed and was stung quite a number of times. Um, this photo here, I always have to say whenever I show this photo that Ralph is actually a very nice person. I have talked to him, <laughs> um, but the Vancouver Sun uh, managed to get, I guess, what's an appropriate photograph um, for somebody when dealing with a problem such as he experienced. But anaphylaxis is rare. Um, you can't see any visible sign of the colony at the surface. Um, you pull up turf, you got these tiny little entrance holes, you know, that are what the European fire ants are coming up through. Um, but I can tell you that they can swarm through those tiny little entrance holes uh, at a spectacular rate. Um, this is a wax cast of a uh, European fire ant nest, kind of showing an interconnectedness of uh, two uh, different entrances uh, scattered across some grasses. The good news about them is they don't like houses. Uh, we don't see them getting in the basements, uh, except in one rare condition um, where there are big cracks in the foundation and teenagers um, that um, were leaving lots of food in the basement. Um, so they stay out of your house. That's good. They don't like the crossroads. Um, the consequence of this, though, is you get really high densities in one city block. Um, as they're sort of trapped um, on this island um, because they won't cross the, uh, the roads. Um, and where they do establish, they absolutely love everything about residential properties. Um, backyards are fantastic. They've got trees and shrubs that kind of keep some moisture in the backyard. Um, plus, they can forage on those trees and shrubs for uh, food. Um, they love to get under the paving stones because of the heat. They love lawn clutter, like old uh, propane tanks, things like that. Uh, kids' toys, if they're just left sitting in contact with the ground, planters. Um, and I have seen them um, as high as four colonies per square meter uh, in, in one property. And they love raised garden beds. And one of the real tragic things about this is that I have talked to a number of gardeners who tried to introduce their kids into gardening um, at um, uh, community gardens. Um, and their young children um, have become terrified of gardening as a consequence of European fire ants. So with respect to control, and I won't go through all of this, <clears throat> this is what doesn't work, um, which is 
almost everything. Uh, we worked on just about everything to sort of see how sensitive um, they are. They're, they're insensitive to cold conditions, freezing conditions. Um, you can put them underwater for hours, days, and they will not drown. Um, <clears throat> Uh, they are uh, perfectly capable of handling native species of ants, uh, biocontrols. Um, they are certainly resistant to surface applied contact insecticides um, and, and so on. So the one technique that I have found that works, but only on a very small scale, um, is to dig out the uh, fire ant nests. And I have a YouTube sort of video sort of explaining how this is done. Take about 10 liters of soil. Um, with the fire ants and use a low concentration permethrin um, to get them under control and then return that soil immediately to the ground. Um, that, um, what happens when you dig into the nest is that the queens will often escape out those lateral tunnels. Um, but if they've got nowhere to return to except treated soil, <clears throat> this does appear to be effective, but it's very labor intensive. Um, there are some pest control companies in Vancouver now that seem to be specializing in this. Um, they use cement mixers instead of buckets, you know, kind of mixing the permethrin with the soil um, that the ants are in, um, but it's really quite, quite expensive. Uh, and it works in small areas. It's, this isn't something that scales up, obviously, um, very easily. In any event, just to finish off, it could be worse. Um, this is a picture in Borneo. Um, this is uh, Andy Suarez uh, and Corey Moreau. Uh, Andy is with the University of uh, Illinois. Corey's with the Chicago Field Museum. Um, and there's something on Andy's hand, um, and it's this. It's a giant carpenter ant, uh, Campanotus gigas. Um, and in the rainforest, with everybody's sweaty hands, we could not get this ant off of Andy's hand. Um, and this is how it had to come off <coughs> with a pair of pliers. So the European fire ant is nothing like this. Um, and in addition, because the European fire ant actually has some upscale property um, um, interests, it tends to be found in whoever does the most gardening gets fire ants. Um, and some of the larger uh, properties in Vancouver as a consequence have had them. And so sometimes you get candy uh, because some of the properties um, actually have their own chefs um, who can produce things like this for you for helping them out in dealing with their, their fire ant problems. So it's not all bad. And so I will end it there. And I know and I apologize for running over time. Um, <clears throat> greatly. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, there we go. Wow, that was a fascinating talk. You should not apologize for running over time. I think uh, we've got lots of questions and uh, that was so interesting. Um, so, I will start with the questions that kind of came through while you were talking. And um, if people have others, feel free to put them in the chat or once I'm done, we can um, you can unmute and we can have a conversation. So the first question um, was about the process for the development of wings. This is when you were talking about their life cycles and the queens and the um, dispersing um, males having wings. Yeah, so uh, with respect to wing production, only the reproductives, of course, reproductives have wings. Um, if it is a male, it has to have wings, so it'll be genetically programmed. But when it comes to the production of new virgin queens, it depends on the species as to what directs it into um, reproductive mode. It's not like honeybees. Um, where honeybees seem to have a, a very established procedure for gel generating new queens. Um, it's a species by species difference. In some cases, there's slightly larger eggs that are treated differently and have slightly different food fed to them that kind of pushes them into the reproductive mode of development. Uh, in, in other cases, it seems to be less clear uh, as to what's kind of pushing them into, uh, into that, uh, into becoming new uh, queens. Great, thank you. Um, another question is about carpenter ants and wondering if they have um, spread or become more abundant on Vancouver Island. 
Um, I get queries about carpenter rats fairly regularly um, because they can cause damage. Uh, there are three things that are usually associated with carpenter rat damage. Uh, the first is a leaky roof. Um, they will usually initiate uh, in timbers which have already been softened by wood. They tend not to uh, initiate a colony in, in sound wood. Um, the property will also have vegetation pushed right up against the foundation. Uh, carpenter ants don't like to be exposed. Um, and so they'll often form uh, trails uh, across grasses um, in which they'll, they'll cover it over with debris and thatch. Uh, and when they reach the concrete of a house, they want to be behind something and not visible. Um, so if you don't have plants right up against the foundation, they will tend not to walk up that concrete and won't move underneath the siding. And then the third thing, of course, is that the main colony is going to be somewhere on the property, you know, usually in woody debris, it can be fence posts. Um, you will occasionally get carpenter ants um, moving into wall voids, you know, without actually exploiting any of the wood. Uh, and I know of one case in Vancouver, um, or a brand new house that was pretty much concrete and glass. Um, when they moved into it, they had a very large carpenter ant infestation, um, and it appeared it was because the contractors had removed woody debris um, during construction, and the colony had nowhere to go except into the new build. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, it's um, it's a leaking roof, and it, and it is kind of funny because people think I'm psychic when I ask them to check their roof. And they go, how did you know we had a leaking roof? Well, <laughs> um, that... 90% of the time, it's a leaking roof that's behind the problem. Are, are carpenter ants, are there any native carpenter ants? Or no? Oh, yes. Several okay. species of carpenter ants. Yeah. Okay. It's usually Campanotus modoc, um, mm -hmm. specifically, that gets into homes. Not always, but that's the most common. Okay. Um, so another question is, um, in response to you, you had some beautiful photographs of close-ups of ants, and you could see the the hair-like projections on their bodies. And so um, someone was wondering what the function was of those fine hairs. Oh, I don't know if I can answer that very well. I have to think about that. It's a good question. Um, I mean, ant hairs or insect hairs generally, you know, usually have a sensory function. You know, that is when they're in contact with something, they bend and it's telling the, uh, the ants um, information about their close surroundings. Um, there are, all ants have hairs to varying degrees, and it might simply be important for navigating in dark tunnels. Mm. Great. OK, thank you. So here's another follow up to the carpenter ant question was actually more about um, someone who says um, she's seeing them more in hollow, hollow cedar trees that are used as bear dens. So she's wondering if you've noticed that. No, I haven't. Um, I mean, carpenter ants will absolutely exploit spaces that um, are available to them. So I wouldn't be surprised at that observation, but I, I would have no reason to believe that that is something which is increasing or changing. Um, okay. Wherever you get, um, wood that is damaged in any capacity that kind of enables an entrance for the carpenter ants to take advantage of, they, they will. Okay. Yeah. Um, another question here is if you have any um, recommended guides to ants. Oh, I can probably send you uh, a couple of titles um, if you're sort of interested. I can't think of them off the top of my head. I'm actually scanning my shelves now. But there have, in the last few years, there have been more uh, books written at an introductory level with respect to ants. Um, it used to be you had to go to the yeah, uh, E.O. Wilson's classic book from uh, 1990, The Ants, was what everybody, whether you were it, you know, whether you remember the public or a scientist, that was the pr almost the only thing that you could find that was provided information about ants. But there's more out there now. Um, I can I can provide a couple of recommendations. Okay, great. Yeah. And I have access to um, the registration list, so I could send it out to people who are here, or we could put it on Twitter or something like that. Um, 
Okay, we have another question here asking, do you have any other tips on how to find stigmatoma on Vancouver Island? You mentioned something about recognizing the kind of wood they prefer. Yeah, it's usually wood which is in a relatively advanced but not complete state of decay. Uh, you know that you can usually kind of pull the bark up with your fingers. Um, so it's kind of gotten to that stage um, of breaking up. Um, and ultimately it's sort of a question of, of looking, um, you know, as I, I often say, if you want to find that, you know, one in a thousand, you know, instance of anything, you have to look a thousand times. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just a question of going out there, um, and just, um, prying around, seeing, you know, what you can find. Uh, stigmatoma has been, become quite popular, uh, recently in sort of the, um, ant hobbyist uh, community. Um, and so a number of them uh, who like Ants Canada um, have been, they, they seem to have actually developed a search image um, and they're readily finding these Dracula ants now. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I think I have all the questions that were in the chat. Um, if anyone would like to add more or or um, unmute and and ask a question, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I get my turn. Or you can raise your hand. Um, well, while I'm waiting to see if anyone adds anything, um, my question is, um, you mentioned all of these invasive ants, and I'm wondering if you have any re recommendations on how um, we as people outdoors or just citizens um, can help to prevent the spread or um, of some of these ants. You mentioned some are in wood, so I'm thinking about not uh, moving firewood and just burning firewood where you buy it and not spreading it around or there are other things that you can suggest yeah so most of these invasives have been, have been urban um, and for example the european fire ants they're being spread largely through the uh, movement of plant material uh, so we've had a couple of instances of landscaping companies um, that have developed infestations and so a lot of their plants and materials that have gone out uh, have gone out with fire ants mm -hmm. um, and so they're moved into the landscape and then um, it's really it takes a while for those ants to move and really begin to spread and become a problem about five years um, there was an instance um, in Vancouver in not the Marpole area but one of the areas that was close to that uh, and I guess a house is being scheduled for demolition but they had some really nice plants and so all the neighbors from all around came and grabbed what they could before the house was knocked down and that house had fire ants um, and those fire ants ended up all over the place as a consequence oh no yeah. so yeah moving ants um uh, so moving plants so taking you know if you can clean off the roots uh, of all of the soil, um, you know, before you bring it onto your property. Um, the ants usually do make themselves fairly readily obvious. Um, at one of the landscaping companies that was having this problem, they kind of finally contacted me for help when customers weren't making it to the till. Um, they were being stung as they were kind of carrying pots, you know, through the shop. Um, so usually the ants do make themselves obvious, but, uh, and so banging the pots to make sure that there are no ants um, present uh, is definitely a good idea. Um, and uh, I see that um, Andrew and Judith have their hand up, but I'm just going to ask um, Rob another um, question first, because it's still on the topic of fire ants, uh, which is... Um, that it's clearly very hard to get rid of them once they're on your, in, around your, you, where you live. Um, any advice on preventing them from colonizing your property? So quite often when you have them on, on, on property, for example, if you use the technique of digging and treating, you, you can get rid of those colonies, but they're probably in your neighbor's property. 
um, and they're going to reinvade. So what I've been suggesting to some homeowners uh, is to put out some simple paving stones, um, uh, ones that maybe are 18 inches long, sort of nine inches wide, like an inch or so thick, and put them around the edge of the property because the fire ants are probably going to move underneath those pavers first. Um, they tend to change their nest locations mostly in the spring, and then some of them will do it again in the fall. So if you put some pavers around the edge of your property um, and then check them every week in the spring and then destroy any nests that are starting to form, um, that's probably the best way uh, to sort of monitor for them. Uh, Van Dusen's been using those pavers to, uh, to monitor for fire ants quite successfully in the last few years. Oh, great. That's, that sounds effective. Um, Andrew, did you want to, or Judith, did you want to? It's Andrew here. Uh, Hi, from Andrew. Duncan again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I told you earlier on that I grew up in Africa and they, there were some things they called flying ants there, which flew up against lights and they fell to the ground wingless. And uh, they're used as a source of protein. And I wondered if there's there of these are ants or if there's some other insect and uh, whether there's any use for these as a kind of human protein source. Um, well, they, they would be, we don't have any here that exist in such large numbers that they could be easily harvested. VR would love to be able to net capture all those swarming ants um, at the ends of their runways um, and, and sort of move them, move them away. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think they self-aggregate in a way that you're describing here. That would sort of make these, them these are the size of a, of a small shrimp, I would think, with wings and so on. And the, you know, kind of you see people around picking up these in, insects which have lost their wings. Right. Um, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be so easy to do that here. Um, I, I do want recall seeing an instance once, apparently in the Balkans, uh, the Balkans during the Second World War, um, they would take the thatching uh, ants and drop them onto tarps and roll up the corners. And the thatching ants would aggregate all of their eggs, larvae and pupae along the rolled edges. Um, and then they would unroll those edges and take all of the larvae and pupae you know, as a food source, you know, for themselves. Um, that's the only instance I can think of where ants um, have been sort of manipulated to provide a kind of a convenient, you know, protein source, you know, yeah. for humans. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We have another question in the chat about um, what effect do you think the flooding events in the lower mainland may have had on ants, uh, non-native and native? Yeah, ants are really quite resilient. Um, the, the European fire ant in particular in North Vancouver, um, there's one park where they are quite abundant. Um, and I have seen a section of that park uh, remain under an inch of water for two months and have no impact whatsoever on the survival of those colonies. As soon as that water drained out the uh, the European fire ant colonies were as vigorous and, and abundant as they ever were. So they seem to be able to tolerate um, flooding um, quite well. I, I've dug them out um, from those conditions and they just bump, they pop up to the surface and then they just drift until, you know, they push up against the edge of something and then they just kind of slowly start walking away. Um, so they're really resilient um, to, to flooding. They're also resilient to forest fires. You can see a burn, you know, go through an area and everything is removed. Um, and you will see swarming ants in the middle of really intense, what had been a really intense fire. Um, you know, they had been down in their nest um, and they're the first thing to pop up again uh, once the fire has passed through. Interesting. Um, any other questions? For Rob. Well, I think uh, I think that might be it. So thank you so much. What an interesting talk. I think we're all gonna do some ant hunting. And uh, yeah, it would be great 
to create a really easy to use guide to get more people interested in ants, to know yeah. what it is that you're looking at so that you sort of understand their natural history. I think that's what you know, makes birds so popular. I mean, it's not just identifying them, but you know their lifestyle and you understand their ecology. Mm -hmm. It kind of you know, connects you to what you're seeing. It, it, with insects, it's tough. If you send me some good pictures, I'll make a little a field guide for for, okay. for students. <laughs> great. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was great. And happy holidays to everybody. Stay safe and get outside and enjoy and relax. Nice to see you. Great. Good night. Good night.